Stop me if you've heard this before, Cowboy fans. Oklahoma State heads into its game against Kansas State with lots of questions. That was the storyline a season ago when the Wildcats came to town and the Cowboys had a 2-2 and record. This season, OSU heads to Manhattan after a head-scratching performance against Utah. What's with the offense? What about Alan Bowman? And why the heck can't Ollie Gordon get going? You've got questions. Tulsa World columnist Barry Trammell and I will attempt to answer them now on The Jenny Carlson Show. But before we get to that, I want to say a big, huge thank you to Visit Stillwater for sponsoring my OSU football coverage this season. If you're headed to Stillwater, you're going to want to head to visit stillwater.org. They've got all sorts of ideas for game day, parking, places to eat. Just head to visit stillwater.org. You'll get all sorts of information for that next time you're going to be in Stillwater. Then I want to encourage you to subscribe. First, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Just hit that subscribe button. It's free, it's easy, but it helps me out a bunch. So I hope you'll subscribe today. Then I hope you consider subscribing to my website, Beyond the Box Score. It's free, or if you'd like to support my work, you can do so for $8 a month. Just go to jennycarlson.substack.com. Well, BT, I laid out several questions in my intro, so let's go through them. First, what is up with the OSU offense? Well, they clearly want to run the ball and can't. So that's problematic. And, you know, it seems clear to me that they're just going to have to unload and throw. They've been throwing a bunch. They lead one of the nation's leader in pass attempts. But I think they're going to have to throw more. But it's it's sort of counter to what they want to do, what Mike Gundy as long has done. They, they want to run the ball. And to abandon the run is just, you know, it goes against everything they believe. However, I do think abandoning the run could bring them back to getting able to run the ball because they got to make people back up. They got to they got to get some um, get some relief off the front wall and give give the offensive line a chance to block those guys. So, I mean, to me, that's it. They just the people are daring them to throw the ball, and so far the Cowboys haven't thrown it well enough. They've thrown it pretty well, but not well enough to really make people pay. Well, this goes a little out of order to the question uh, questions that I ask in the intro, but let's go to the run game and Ollie Gordon. Um, obviously, such a huge talent, bring all those offensive linemen back. If we ask why the heck can't Ollie Gordon get going, I know what Mike Gundy would say because he said it repeatedly. It's about the defense bringing extra half, an extra half defender, an extra full defender, whatever the case is, but that had to happen last year. So. What's at the heart of why the run game has been so stagnated? Well, I I, I think part of it is the the extra half guy or guy in the box. But I also don't think I don't think the OSU offensive line has performed the way it it needed to. And I don't know that they're pushing people off and creating the holes. And we haven't seen enough ingenuity to uh, out of the game plans to to create running space in other ways. And it's just been a, a collaboration of of inefficiency so I don't know you know we saw this in a couple of games down the stretch Central Florida basically said no no chance you're running on us like that and Brigham Young was sort of hard on them and Texas A&M a little bit but um, but not to this extent in terms of this this is this is basically three straight games of of Ollie Gordon living like he lived against Central Florida so um very discouraging for Ollie, discouraging for the line, discouraging for the offense, for the fan base. Everybody's discouraged, but uh, they got to figure it out and figure out a way to to get that ball moved because there's still a lot to play for. Cowboys are still in the running for uh, a Big 12 championship run, but they can't, uh, you know, I'm not sure they can afford a second loss. If they, if they lose at K-State, probably have to run the table for any chance at Arlington. You alluded to scheme to an extent uh, as it relates to the run game. And you and I have heard Mike Gundy say myriad ways that game plans are not good enough. We heard it after um, that, that come from behind victory against Arkansas. We heard it again after the Utah loss. And then we heard it again two days after the Utah loss. So Casey Dunn, what is your what's your sense of 
job security with him, uh, messaging behind the scenes to him. I mean, if Mike Gundy's saying some of the things publicly he's saying, I guess we can only guess what he's saying behind closed doors. Yeah, and you know, he said nobody wants to see him on Sundays uh, in the office because he, he said he's policing it pretty pretty dip, uh, uh, pretty hard. But we haven't seen a lot of changes, haven't seen a lot of uh, effect on that. So I would... Uh, I would be worried if I was Casey Dunn or part of that offensive staff because hey, you're right. Gundy has sort of blared the trumpet. You know, hey, this isn't good enough, and hey, here's here's part of the problem. You know, he didn't like the game plan again against Arkansas, but did laud the change at halftime. Said we got it, we got it going in the second half. He liked the game plan. He said for the uh, Utah game, but. He didn't think that they got to the right stuff quick enough or at all. And, I, you know, that's that's play calling. It's two different things, game planning, play calling, two different things. And that's a perfect example of, of what what each one is. Is we had, the, we had some good plays, we just didn't use them, yeah. is what Gundy said. So uh, that's an indictment of Casey Dunn and Tim Rattay and whoever, Charlie Dickey, whoever's involved in the offense decision-making. It's also an indictment of Mike Gundy. I mean, he's sitting there with headset on. I mean, he could say, hey, what about the, you know, the, the counter series or, you know, whatever they might have had. I don't know what they had. Yeah. But uh, whatever it might be that he wished that he got to, I know somebody that could get him to that. You know, it's just like, uh, you know, the famous uh, scene in the press box several years ago when, uh, you know, Mike Sherman was up there, our sports editor, and uh, uh, some great, I think it was when Dewan. DeWan Woods almost made the catch at the end of the game. I think it was 07 in Bedlam and had a great picture of DeWan trying to make this catch in the back of the end zone. And Sherm said something like, man, I wish I wish we could run that one. And I said, yeah, I wonder, I wonder who could uh, take care of that for us. Uh, if only we had like, you know, this sports editor who could call somebody and say, do this. Mike Gundy's the head coach. He could call somebody and say, do this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that headset, as we understand, it goes both ways. He's not just listening, he's communicating. Yeah, which I asked Mike Gundy about that field goal drive that they had in the drive that ended in a field goal against Utah, which was highly creative. I mean, we saw a trips set with three wide receivers out to the left at one point, and that included Alan Bowman. I mean, they did some stuff in that drive that I was like, Hey, this is this is the stuff, and I think that's what Mike Gundy was talking about. But they never got back to it. We never saw that level of creativity again. So yeah, offensive play calling, offensive game planning, seems like it's definitely in the crosshairs right now to get this offense back on track. The other question, Barry, coming out of the Utah game is Oklahoma State points forward is what about Alan Bowman? Now, obviously, he's a starter for the Cowboys, but. What did we see against Utah? What the heck happened there? Well, he was playing terrible, and you know, Gundy made the made the rare decision for uh, an in game pull. You don't see this very often. You see sometimes midweek they make a quarterback change, mid season, all that kind of stuff. But in the middle of a game, you don't see it that often. Uh, going through Oklahoma State history, I've I came up with a couple of three, but. You just, it's not something uh, that happens much. Uh, I think famously it happened with a coach named Mike Gundy, his freshman year playing Houston. Pat Jones made the call. But it doesn't, you know, Gundy's theory, and I assume he's telling us the truth, was, you know, this was not a permanent, you know, what we saw in Norman seemed like a changing of the guard and, you know, that kind of thing. I don't think that's what we saw in Stillwater. I think Gundy just... Literally wanted him to settle down. I don't know why you need a 24-year-old quarterback to settle down in college football. I mean, they, he wasn't playing at, you know, Grapevine High School last last season. He's been around forever. But, uh, and they go back to him, and Gundy said, clearly he's our quarterback. And that's true. But I, OSU would probably look at other options if they thought they had some. You know, Garrett Rangel clearly was not, didn't really produce. Hasn't really wowed anybody in his four or five chances over the last two years. And and then Zane Flores, everybody thought he's the future. He's really a good prospect. He apparently can't even get up the depth chart. 
even to the point to be prepared to play. So that was sobering to me was when no was no Zane Flores, and I you know that that opened my eyes about the future of OSU quarterbacking. Is he the guy for the future? I don't know, but we know this: Alan Bowman's the guy for the present. They just don't they don't have any other options. Well, that backup situation, I was going to ask you about that because it seems like to me the way Rangel played. Now, it was a small sample size, obviously, but not good at all, obviously. Does that maybe change the backup situation? Part of what Mike Gundy, his explanation for not playing Zane Floors was that uh, Rangel, if there's extra snaps to be gotten, it's Rangel that gets them, not Floors. Floors very inexperienced, but he's been on campus for a very long time, so... As as Rangel, so is there a chance Flores moves up to second team, gets a few more reps, maybe becomes more that guy? I don't know. I'm like you, though. I felt like if that was the the best backup option, OSU better hope Alan Bowman does not get hurt. Yeah, I got to believe Flores will get more looks uh, this week and going forward. I mean, it just seems crazy not to. Um. You know, I was confused. I think you asked him the question, or somebody asked him about floors, and he basically said he just he wasn't he wasn't uh, there yet. And I had no idea what he mean by that. I said, "Well, yeah, I don't even know what you mean, Mike." And uh, so they gotta they gotta get it going uh, one way or the other because we know this: uh, the odds are not great that our good friend Alan Bowman is going to be back for an eighth year. You know, yeah, I think he's probably gone. They're going to have to hit the portal. They're going to have to rest with one of these guys. They got to do something at quarterback. So I don't know what's going to happen to Oklahoma State football 2025, but it's going to be uh, a change, and they're going to have to we're going to have to redo a lot of that offense. And it starts with the quarterback. So yeah, that and that's you know, but that's in the future. For this for this current you know for the present, they need Alan Bowman to play better. Than he played against Utah. Okay, I don't know if we've solved any of the uh, offensive problems, but we've at least talked through them a little bit. Let's talk a little defense for a minute before we get to some predictions and some look ahead to this game against K-State. OSU defense allowed 456 yards against Utah, but I termed it the unit's best performance under Brian Nardo since he arrived a season ago. They were out there forever, Barry, because of the offensive struggles. But am I crazy for thinking the OSU defense... Took a nice step forward against Utah. Yeah, I know what was was it? You said forty four minutes. Is that what they were out there? I think, I think it was. Yeah, I think it was forty two, maybe forty two. Um, the only caveat is that they didn't play against Cam Rising. They yeah. played against Isaac Wilson. Yeah, the uh, the freshman for Utah, but he played pretty solid. And um, this is a this is a good culture football program. So. It was a really good. Now they gave up a lot of rushing yards. Uh, Bernard was at 182 yards rushing, I think. Michael Bernard did really good tailback. So there were things you just you know drive you crazy, but to hold that team to 22 points with the position that some of some of the uh, OSU defense was placed in was really good. And to have a chance to win, now I know it was a long shot. The two late touchdowns made it closer than it looks. But OSU's kicking an onside kick with a minute left in the game, you know, with a chance to at least, you know, make it interesting. So for the offense to be that bad and OSU still to be in the game till the end, I thought was a great, was a great uh, positive for the uh, OSU defense. Arkansas was a little different. You know, there was a tight game with Cowboys won, and you had to sort of thank the offense. The defense was torched a good part of that game. Not so Saturday. So if the defense can progress, give them time to figure out the running game, maybe this season turns around. Yeah, they'll have a challenge with Avery Johnson on Saturday in Manhattan. But I've got another am I crazy for thinking question. Am I crazy for thinking K-State might be the most unpredictable team in the Big 12? Narrow win against Tulane. Big win against Arizona. A team that a lot of people expect to be in the running for the Big 12 title. And then a big loss at BYU. I mean, what in the world is going on with the Wildcats? Two straight blowouts. A blowout win, a blowout loss. Nobody saw that coming. We thought Arizona at K-State's going to be a great game. We thought K-State at Brigham Young going to be a tight game. We sort of think 
I mean, I don't know what anybody thinks. I sort of think tight game in Manhattan with OSU. But, yeah, it's it's very strange. Uh, K-State is a – K-State, for somebody that plays so fundamental football, somebody that plays, you know, sort of – Don't beat yourself. Right. Mistake-free and Chris Kleiman, Bill Snyder, culture type. And, hey, you're going to have to beat us. We're not beating ourselves. Uh don't throw it around a ton, still relies on the running game. Man, they're unpredictable. Man, they're explosive. They give up they give up big plays, they create big plays. Um the punt return, you know, they have a great punt against Brigham Young and the guy picks it up on the run going the wrong way just to and he goes ninety three yards against K State. And K State's great on special teams. So it's a very strange K State team so far. But they are explosive. They got playmakers. Edwards at the tailback, Avery Johnson at quarterback. I mean, this is a guy that is so good that they're so um, enchanted with that uh, they let go of a quarterback who's good enough to start at Ohio State today. I don't know exactly why Ohio State wanted Will Howard, but they did, and K-State's fine with that. So Avery Johnson is going to be a pill, going to be a hassle to, to contain him. A quarterback who can run will cause you all kinds of problems. So we'll see how the Cowboys do. Well, let's get to that. How will the Cowboys do on Saturday in Manhattan? 11 o'clock start there at Bill Snyder Stadium. What's your prediction for this one, Barry? Well, I got the, I got the Cats winning. I think I said, uh, I think I said 28-27. Uh, you know, I picked Utah 21-20, to and I uh, missed that by a mile. It was 22-19. to I was uh, one point off of each team. You know, would have been a lot better for uh, all concerned if it, instead of uh, one point the directions they win, if they'd have crossed over and OSU wins 21-20. But I got another tight game. I think it's time for K-State to play a tight game. As we said, the two blowouts, that's crazy. So, But it's a hard place to win. Probably the best home field advantage in the uh, new look Big 12. It was probably the uh, best home field advantage in the old look Big 12. So Manhattan, a very tough place to play. OSU's won some out there, up there, but uh, not consistently. Very difficult to do. Yeah, I I think it's going to be a close game as well. I actually think Oklahoma State's going to get some stuff figured out. Uh, maybe I'm maybe I'm uh, too Pollyannish to think so, but I'm going to go OSU twenty four twenty in Manhattan. But this is a game that's going to have huge ramifications on the Big Twelve race. Lose this one for either team, and they've got two losses in the Big 12. going to be really hard to make Arlington, I think. I think. I'm not sure, Barry. I guess maybe maybe two-loss team could. Three-loss. maybe. Well, two-loss for sure. I think a two-loss team could get there, but, man, you don't want to get too far down that road, I wouldn't think. No, it's, and it's too early to tell how the Big 12 standings are going to fall out. Right now it looks like, oh, you know, somebody like Iowa State or Central Florida, you're going to say, oh, they're going to. They're going to jump everybody and have great records, but you never know. I mean, we could still have all kinds of topsy-turvy. The only thing we know is Utah's likely to be in the mix near the top or at the top. I mean, the Utes seem to be what they were in the Pac-12, rock solid, not flinching, not uh, you know, not move, getting knocked around. To think that Utah is going to, going to have a dip is probably unlikely. Yeah, to go on the road to Oklahoma State last week with their backup quarterback and to win that game might not have been the prettiest from the Utah's van- or from the Utes' vantage point, but still a win nonetheless. So, yeah, I think that has to put them sort of in the driver's seat right now. All right, Barry, before we get out of here, tell people what you got coming up uh, OSU-related. They might want to look for it at TulsaWorld.com. Well, I got a couple of columns uh, the rest of the week. One is on in-game quarterback switches. Like I said, we don't see it much. We saw it both in Stillwater and Norman the politics behind it, the effectiveness of it. Does it really work? We don't know. Uh, we'll see how it, how it handles itself with the Cowboys. And also the home field advantages. I think Sooners are going to Auburn, playing uh, maybe the best home field advantage in the SEC at, at Jordan-Hare Stadium. Same goes for Bill Snyder Family Stadium in Manhattan. Just tremendous home field advantage. What those home field advantages mean for those teams. All right. Thanks, Barry. Appreciate it. Be Jacko. That's all the time we have for now, but I want to ask you to subscribe to my YouTube channel and to my website, Beyond the Box Work. It's easy, it's free, but if you want to support my work financially, I would appreciate that too. You can do that at jennycarlson.substack.com. 
Also, you can find this episode and all episodes of The Jenny Carlson Show on your favorite podcast app. If you like what you hear, please leave a review. A quick word of thanks to my video dream team, Jacqueline Musgrove and Michael Lane. Thanks for joining me, and we'll see you next time.